Oh, hello and welcome to Mission 77 of my camera act series where we'll look at way behind the scenes stuff in cutscenes. Sorry, I'm just trying to figure out if the intro of the guy saying taste of multiple women was strange or... Anyway, I don't know if you know this, but new intro! It's a bit all over the place with a lot going on, but I thought I would just go all out this time. It also serves as a bit of practice for the new editing software I'm using, Adobe Premiere, yeah, but you got it else. Which is also why the text may look different. Anyway, today we're doing it on PO, so... Wow, I can't help but notice that CJ had the phone up and ready at his ear before it even started ringing. Either he's sidekick or constantly expecting his phone ringing every moment. I think having your phone at your ear all the time is pretty usual these days, but it wasn't then as far as I'm aware. Oh god, I had enough of the chips last time! Now I have to have karma chips to list too. Next time someone asks me for chips, the meaning behind it will never be as obvious as it used to be. The series has changed me in so many ways. Particularly chip related ones. Anyway, as usual, I don't know what Truth is talking about. I think basically what they did is they died, went to heaven, and met up with a lizard who was actually God. That's about what I'm gathering from its gibberish. That doesn't sound much fun to me personally. Japanese backhouse. I seem to be by some Japanese people then. They are pretty remarkable. I'm pretty sure they're either aliens or from a few centuries in the future, for many reasons. I think they invented video games, right? Using their alien slash future technology? Must have. By the way, if any Japanese people are watching, that's a compliment. I think. It's not bad if you're an alien, you're just unique. Bit of a spoiler, the direction told me the names of how many people there were before I even got there. Whole game ruined. That cutscene was kinda of boring though, since it was just CJ talking on the phone. Don't know why they felt the need for that to have a cutscene, but whatever. The phone just went through the ground, but that's normal. Like I said, everyone in Andres just has their phone floating around underneath, under, underneath them, everywhere they go. They have advanced technology. Probably Japanese technology. I don't think Carl is Japanese, though. Well, they told Woozy he wasn't Chinese, not Japanese, so it's still possible. This could take a while, so I guess I'll skip straight there with some sort of fancy new premiere transition. Speaking of which, I can tell you how good it feels to be able to set up those multi-camera cutscenes so quickly. But, well, I guess it was inevitable that I would flip at some point with the way I was driving. Naturally, it's going to end up blowing up the other car now. This is why you shouldn't drive drunk, kids. Although I wasn't actually drunk. Also, kids shouldn't be driving. Or getting drunk. That's three problems to one if you're driving drunk. So taking my advice is terrible. Now, how did he open the door and fall on the floor facing the sky when I just shot him in the head? I suppose his dead body meant to fall in the handle with enough force for it to swing open his body's to somehow coincidentally land facing the sky in a star position with no visible head wound. Also, there's no bullet hole in the windscreen. Just being tracked isn't enough. Plus, it just occurred to me that nobody in this game actually locks their doors. Man, this game's just ridiculous. Wow, with all this fancy editing, I'm almost like a professional channel. Well, not really. It still looks all very amateur looking, like someone trying to figure their way out around new video editing software. Which is exactly the case, but whatever. Over time, I'll get used to it. Anyway, I swapped out the bag for this taxi because I made the mistake of not bringing a four-door car enough time to have learned my lesson, as you'll see in this next cutscene. I'd just like to point out that they were in a totally different spot before the cutscene, lying on the hill and definitely very conscious. Were they ghosts? Did they teleport and knock their heads on the rock? Did more time pass during that fate of black? No. He got up surprisingly quick there, considering how dazed he apparently was a second ago. But I thought I was familiar with the British species since I'm part of it. I thought you just gave him a plate of tea and crumpets and they calmed right down, like a monkey with a banana. This wasn't what I was picturing at all though. Because I'm British doesn't mean I understand what half these things mean, because I don't. I don't like Macca anyway, he's more annoying than funny to me. Fortunately, I only plays a minor role. Oh, and it's Kent Baldwin by City too. Woohoo. This cutscene isn't great for camera either. They teleport about a bit, but nothing particularly remarkable happens. The disadvantage of there being three cutscenes in one mission is that they seem to cut back on the weirdness side of things, which is a shame. It's a cutscene over yet. I seem to be the master of bad timings as I moved the camera at the exact moment that Ken Paul used the force to lift the rag from underneath the sand. I don't know how I do it. Well, he still very obviously didn't get that out of his pocket. It seemed to appear out of nowhere. Also, Carl's legs seemed to be partially embedded in the ground. Is it quicksand or just really deep? I feel like he isn't panicking enough for that though. Maybe he's just shrinking. I guess the side effect of that is losing your feet. Yes, that makes perfect sense. I should have bought a two-door, actually. Then I would have had an excuse to leave Macca behind. He can just sit here fantasizing and touching himself in scary places until he dies. That's pretty much all he does anyway. There it goes again, spoiling everything before I actually know. 
I fought the cutscene and established we were going to the casino. This is really just a mission to introduce these new characters, but of course they need some action to really be worth it. Unfortunately, when they thought of action plus snakes, they didn't think of Carl fighting a whole load of few snakes. That would have been much more interesting. Apparently snake farms exist, but I don't know what kind of insane person would want to feed snakes. Some people actually like snakes, and as far as I can tell, they are also insane. I don't care what anyone says, those things are monsters. Well, that was terrifying. I promise I won't make women scream at you every episode. Don't any of you creepy people take that the wrong way either. No screaming whatsoever. I was not surprised he's feeling ill, look all bumping around all over the place. As someone who suffers from car sickness, I would probably die if I was in that car. I feel the need to apologise to the car for subjecting it to such torment. Not just bumping it around, but also putting it at risk of being covered in vomit, dead bodies, or lack of bodily fluids. Well, I can't say that was the most convincing vomit effect I've ever seen in my life, especially since the vomit particles appeared before the animation that had caught up with it, but I guess it's better than looking disgustingly realistic and all of you guys throwing up on your computer screen and unsubscribing. Then again, I did suspect some of you puke finishers. Oh god. I looked it up, it's an actual thing called emetophilia, sexual arousal by vomiting on people. Sorry for mentioning that, that's just horrible. Ugh, I promise never to bring it up again. Although if any emetophiles, yes that's the name, are watching, I would like to apologise for calling your fetish horrible. But you're still really weird. Might as well be truthful about it. Come on, can't be that bad. Surely they don't have to kill them, and me, even though I wasn't involved for it. I swear, everyone in this game has a gun. Anyway, I assume the band members were eaten by rather snakes and all these people. They remind me of the creepy family from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, so naturally they must also be cannibals. I mean, everyone knows Leatherface is in the game, hiding with Bigfoot and the aliens in the cabin in Shaded Creeks with occasional visits by CJ Mom's ghost and the Mothman, so it can't be that far-fetched. Hopefully Leatherface doesn't send his pet sharks and dinosaurs to deal with me for killing them. Seriously, I've got a list of a bunch of myths that at least one normal person has actually considered to be true. Man, the one about the ghost traffic light is terrifying, isn't it? I can't believe Rockstar predicted Slenderman and hid him in the game before he was even created. <gasps> Squidward, the most heart-stopping myth of all. Run! Psst. In case you couldn't tell, I'm mocking them. Because they're all ridiculous. Well, admittedly, Rosie does sound a lot like a girl's name, but still, this guy's unhealthily obsessed. Plus, I'm not even sure what kind of weird names referred to, but I'm pretty sure I don't want to find out. Is that what people normally do to calm down? It seems kind of productive to me, seeing as it should do the exact opposite since it increases your heart rate. I don't want to know if it's a method that works for any of you guys, but I don't think I'll try it the next time I'm stressed about getting a promotion in front of my boss or something. Anyway, I'm pretty sure Maka started it since he was the one who started talking. It could have been a nice, relaxing, peaceful drive, and naturally he had to go and ruin it. When Salvatore asked me to kill him later, I'll just ignore the plot and do it anyway. Then me and Salvatore will be best buddies and we will live the city together. By extension, I'll become best buddies with Claude, and we'll be great. Well, until the part where he kills Salvatore, that probably wouldn't be as great. Spoilers, by the way, for a 14 year old game. I know, such a short amount of time, I'm sorry. That's not fair at all. It was that guy's fault for not taking a crazy smoking taxi speeding down the road at him. If someone needs to get in trouble, it should be him. Or at the very least, he should take partial blame for the unfortunate incident of that random woman I don't care about being murdered by the person whose car I hit. And not me. Obviously. Well, it's fine. They'll just let me out of jail in a day anyway if I insist I won't commit crimes ever again. Even if I've been in jail a million times and use that excuse every time. I guess these are just very forgiving cops. For all the things I've done in this game, I should be serving about a hundred life sentences in prison. I swear on my mum I won't kill anyone else. Whoa, he swore on his mum. Serious business, he definitely can't risk anything that this time. Let him out. Well, Colt probably sound more black in his case. Call you black. Don't know if you know this, but he is. Shocker. How did they even get in? The hallway's a dead end. That's probably the question you should be asking when someone somehow manages to break into your floating office. So, are you trapped up here forever or what? Got any snacks? Oh right, you probably have teleportation powers. Just thought I'd um, let you see the ghost door opening by itself and Ken Paul teleporting Mac and CJ going inside the guard and Mac are walking through the table. I don't even know where to start there. We've already established this game is haunted and that everyone's teleportation powers. I did theorize that CJ was a ghost in the recent HIU episode, but perhaps this confirms it. Either that or that old man told him a thing or two about molestation. I don't know how many times Mac and CJ teleported in the time that I was talking, but it's definitely an unnecessarily large amount. 
I mean, they're not even talking, they're just standing around watching. I guess they're just a bit bored then. In fact, children. I'm pretty sure Maka actually is a child, except, you know, a very sexually oriented one. That's normal, right? Somehow Ken has become even more useless, even more annoying, even more incompetent, and just in general worse since Vice City. Don't know how, but he did it. Remember when we played Vice City, guys? Ah, those were the days. What, you don't remember? Well, if I try hard enough, I convince you that it happened, and then I won't have to worry about it. Carl sure was desperate to get out of there, wasn't he? I don't blame him. The combination of Ken and Maka must be difficult to bear. Why did that guard open the door if Carl already left? How did he even open the door? Is he telekinetic? It would be difficult to choose between Maka and Ken, the annoying, useless idiots, or Woozy and his slave, the blind guy and the also annoying guy. Seems like everyone annoys me. Can I switch sides? I just hope Carl is a triple agent. They think he's working for them. I mean, that's like planning against them, but that is also the reason he really is working for Caligula's. And then he'll reveal he really is working for Ruby. That's a bit pointless. But I could take advantage of the confusion to break into... whoever I'm robbing. By this point, I'm not sure. Carl's like Snape. Except he's not a wizard. Well, he might be, considering the teleportation and help and stuff. Also, he doesn't die at the end. Well, he might after the end of the game. Oh, and Carl Black. That's a big difference. I think that gives him a huge advantage over Snape. If anyone ever asks you if Snape or Carl would win the fight, now you know how to answer. But no one's ever going to ask you that. God, I've really gone on, don't I? I need to end this video. Thanks for watching. Remember to leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed, and leave feedback in the comments if possible to help me improve. Next time we'll be doing Mission 78, Intensive Care, where we'll probably continue to debate what side we're on and become a paramedic. Carl really does do everything in this game. Anyway, Carl has something to say. <laughs> Goodbye.